My name is Roger Berkowitz, welcome. Uh, I'm the academic director here at the Hannah Arendt Center uh, at Bard College. And we are um, getting very close to the end of Hannah Arendt's book, The Life of the Mind. Um, uh, we are in volume two of the book, uh, reading the penultimate chapter on Heidegger, uh, Heidegger's will not to will. Um, uh, in order to, to make sense of, of the Heidegger, we have to remember a little bit um, of, of the history and Nietzsche's repudiation of the will, the, the previous chapter. Um, remember that for Nietzsche, there's a two in one in the will, but it's not the two in one of thinking. And it's not simply the willing and nilling of Paul, um, where I know what I should will, but what I should will, but I will otherwise. It's the two in one in the sense of command and obedience, um, that the I for Nietzsche, the self, is that which overcomes this duality and thinks that I command, and that there's a pleasure in this triumph, a kind of joy that comes from abundance and life in which the will is this power to overcome any resistance. Um, and uh, in this sense, there's a way in which the will to power is life itself or overcoming and abundance and power. Um, there's another aspect of Nietzsche's work, which is the uh, thought of the eternal return of the same in which we, uh, in a sense, realize the limitations on our will, that there's certain things that even our will to power can't accomplish, namely to change the past, to, to, to overcome that past. Um, and uh, in that feeling of impotence and resentment or in response to that, um, the will in a sense, in order to keep willing and feeling powerful, simply wills what is, amor fati, to love the world as it is, thus I willed it, not to change it, and thus to remove all intention and meaning and morals, and to simply stamp being on becoming. Um, and, 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 and so this is um, uh, her reading of, of Nietzsche on the will, um, uh, in which we have to so powerfully will that we repudiate will through our will, I think is, is, is one way to put it. Um, uh, um, that's, that's, uh, that's a quick, I hope, uh, review, uh, not, not adequate, but we spent a whole 90 minutes on it last week on, on the Nietzsche. And I gather there will be more questions on that when we get to the Q and A, um, which is great. So, the, the Heidegger um, chapter, uh, which is the last, um, I was going to say last substantive chapter, which is not right, um, but is the last chapter on thinkers in the section on willing. Most of the sec chapters on uh, in the section on willing are on particular thinkers and how they think of the will. Um, um, Heidegger is a is to some degree, as RN says, an interesting choice because in all of his early work, and so his work from being in time and in something like 1929 until um, uh, the middle of um, the Nazi era in the mid 19, late 1930s, um, he doesn't write about willing at all. It's not, um, uh, it's not a concern of his in his work. Um, it's not something I would have thought of, but Arendt points it out in the first paragraph of, of, of this chapter, and it seems right. Um, I obviously haven't checked it, but I assume she's right on this. Um, and, and, and so willing is not part of um, his, his original work. So why is he here? Well, uh, in the 1930s, late 1930s, um, uh, and, and let's just you know, I don't want to, well, let me just say, um, I think it's fairly well known that um, Heidegger joined the Nazi party 
for a, a brief period, about a year uh, between 1932 and 1933. Um, actually, let me say, he stayed in the Nazi party um, throughout the war, never actually with, withdrew from it, but um, uh, worked for the Nazi party from 1932 to 1933, um, was, um, was considered not a reliable Nazi by the Nazis and um, uh, and wasn't, but uh, and was relieved of his duties and to some degree prevented from teaching, large degree prevented from teaching by the Nazis um, for the rest of the 30s and, and, and the war. Um, he, during this time, held private lectures um, and the, the and from 1936 for the next two years, his lectures were on Nietzsche. Um, and, and these are extraordinary lecture courses where he's grappling both with Nietzsche, but also with National Socialism. Um, and, uh, and Arendt says that these are a turning, these are the source of his turning point. Um, you know, it's, a, it's one of these widely talked about things if you're a scholar of Heidegger of, what the, the turn is, de Kera, his great turn, and what that means. Um, and, um, and, um, and so it's, he writes about the turn only in the 19, late 1940s after the war, um, uh, but she argues that it actually can be dated here in 1936 between, specifically between volume one and volume two of the Nietzsche uh, lectures. Um, you know, I don't want to get too caught up in the Heidegger dating stuff and, and, and the turn, and there's a lot of uh, inside baseball and Heidegger scholarship about, you know, this and that, not to mention the fact that his own vocabulary is incredibly difficult and at times, um, well, uh, it can be it can be off-putting. I, I don't think he writes in jargon per se, although um, Many people who try and copy him certainly do. Um, that said, what's going on here? Why is what what is going on with his encounter um, with Nietzsche? Um, I think the 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 core of it, um, the core idea, um, which Arendt begins to talk about on page uh, one seventy five of the text is that she says, we're gonna start with the original reversal. So she's saying that there are two reversals um, in Heidegger's uh, work. Um, one is the uh, reversal um, that takes us uh, from uh, the turn against the self assertion of man. And the other is the turn against the subjectivization that happened in being in time. And they turn to the, um, uh, oblivion of being as primary uh, over man. Again, we're not going to get, I hope, too wrapped up in it, but we'll see. But let's start on page 175, where she says, we started with the original reversal. Um, even in the first Nietzsche volume, where Heidegger carefully follows Nietzsche's descriptive characterization of the will, he uses what later appears as the ontological difference, the distinction between the being of being or the being of beings, as it's usually written, the sein des Seines, and the isness or Zionite of entities. Uh, okay, this is, I mean, look, Heidegger can be complicated, but if you just think of one sentence, which is the sentence that I always tell my students to just hold on to, the being of beings is not itself a being, right? The Zion, the Zion des Seines is nicht selbst ein Zion des. If you can understand that, or at least hold it in your head, the being of beings, it means that if you take a being, the pen or me or any being, anything that is, and you say, what's the being of it? What is it? Well, it's being is not a being, right? It's not something that is. Um, what is it? Well, that's a, it's a complicated question. Um, but Heidegger wants to say that we don't reduce all that is, all beings, simply to another being. That there's something in each being beyond something 
that is that in fact he'll say that something that is not um uh and so um what he she says here is that um uh in these according to his interpretation the will to power signifies the isness the being will to power right as we said before for nietzsche is life is um a kind of overcoming it's a kind of joy and will to power uh is 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 a function of this life process the world comes into being through the carrying out of this life process so in willing um we uh we set the world to be we make the world happen the world is about this becoming um um and that this is and that and the eternal return of the same, she then goes on to say, is the being of being or being of beings. It's the um, it's it's not a being itself. It's something beyond that. Uh, OK, why does any of this matter? Um, because she's saying that Heidegger moves from seeing the will to power in volume one as part of this life instinct as life as as about what is as talking about what is and so in the volume one of his reading of nietzsche he still sees the will to power along the lines of this ontological difference where there is something that is and there's something beyond what is in in later in the volume two and in his later work, she's arguing, he comes to see the will to power, not in relation to beings, but as something like the will to dominate, the will to rule. Um, and this becomes absolutely essential for all of Heidegger's later thought, right? Because what he comes to see is that in the human will in our willing um there is a deep will to rule to dominate all things to um to master so on 177 right she'll say near the bottom of the first or continued paragraph the will to will the i'm sorry the will i'm here she's citing nietzsche or heidegger on nietzsche i believe the will is to the will is to will to be master it is fundamentally and exclusively command in the command the one who issues the command obeys himself thus the commanding self is its own superior and so will ceases to be about a, a being and seeks to be simply about commanding ruling mastering about power and it's this turn in heidegger's work where he comes to see man kind humanity as um deeply caught up in the need to dominate the world, to make the world a human world, um, to uh, impose human will and human values on the world. Um, and this comes to be part of his reading of Nazism, right? Not just Nazism, but much of uh, Western um, uh, thought. Um, that there is a desire to, in the ability, in the desire to impose one's will on the world, to make man the master of the world. Um, we resent all obstacles and limits the past being one of them but also all objects that 
um, uh, resist our power, our mastery. And so we will to destroy them, to use them, to turn them into beings that are at our disposal, to make them disposable beings, including to make the earth disposable beings. And in the height of Heidegger's reading, also to make all humans disposable beings, superfluous. Be humans become, as we say today, without blinking in all of our language, human resources. We become resources for some project which we humans will create and uh, approach. And in therefore, I'm sorry. <clears throat> in the will to power, the will to master, is the will to make all beings, including the earth and all human beings, um, um, disposable, fungible, usable, malleable for whatever project we humans decide to embark upon. And, and this is the reading that Heidegger comes to, through Nietzsche, um, to bring upon um, uh, the sort of, the, 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 the kind of human beings that have emerged um, uh, in, in, modern, in the modern world. Um, human beings who see all, um, um, all beings, including ourselves, as, as, um, as what he calls bestand, things that simply stand there to be used for whatever purpose uh, we, uh, we, we, we have. And it is in, and, and, and he comes to see the Nazis as one manifestation of this, um, but certainly not the only one. And he thinks that it's a very American approach. So he compares the Americans to the Nazis in, in ways that, um, you know, uh, it's, 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 it's an approach that basically thinks that we can constantly overcome whatever limitations we have and make the world the way we want to make it. Um, and, and so his reaction to this is that since it is the fundamental drive of, of the will, which leads us to believe that we can make all beings, including ourselves, disposable and usable and um, basically malleable for whatever ends, that the, um, the way to respond to that is to, um, will not to will. So whereas Nietzsche seeks to will the eternal return to embrace whatever has happened so that we um, continue to will um, what is because we need to keep willing because that's what life is about and gives us power. Heidegger says we actually have to step back. And this is where you get a critique of Heidegger as a kind of um, passive person who says, oh, well, the world's going to hell in a handbag. We just have to sit down and walk in the forest and think and not act. Although thinking, he thinks, isn't acting. Um, and so he, he, he has this idea, which Arendt talks about on page 178, of, of Gelassenheit, or letting be. Um, uh, and um, in this idea of Gelassenheit, we need to, um, in a sense, uh, let the world, let things be in their essence so that we don't impose our 
essence, our, our, our intent on them. So if we have um, a river, let the river be a river. Don't make it into a waterway. Don't make it into a, uh, a well to feed people by damming it. Don't uh, fill it and then plant crops on it or don't, you know, um, turn it into, let it be a river, right? That's, that's his approach. Uh, or not as approach in general, but that's 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 the idea of Galassonheit is to let beings be, including human beings, right? Let them be without imposing our will on them. Um, and uh, um, and so uh, that is sort of the that is one um, response of Heidegger's um, to to the to the sort of domination of will that goes from uh, Saint Paul and Augustine up through uh, Nietzsche that we've um, that we've read uh, in the book. Um, what else do we need to, to, to talk about in this, in this chapter? The last few pages are on ex, enac, the Anaximander fragment. I'm gonna leave those for now. If you have questions about them, we can, we can talk about them. Um, I mean, I'll just say this. Um, um, Heidegger and Nietzsche both come to disavow the will, right? This is how I'll end an introduction and then you can have questions. Heidegger and Nietzsche both disavow the will. He uh, Nietzsche repudiates it. Heidegger says we have to will not to will. Um, and the will as the subjective faculty or the faculty of nihilism, the faculty that um, would rather will nothing, Nietzsche says, or as Heidegger says, the will that would rather destroy um, uh, all beings, um, uh, in order to satisfy its power. For Arendt, um, this, their, their rejection of will and thus of action, and remember Heidegger does, well, as, as Arendt says, Heidegger embraces action simply as thinking. Thinking as, I mean, this is gonna, for Heidegger, thinking, which also relates to thinking, which is a kind of, um, being thankful for the world. But the thinking as a thinking is a thinking and thinking of being, which is not a being, right? Not a, which is not one of the beings of the world. And is, um, uh, is, is, a, is, a, is, a, is a standing in this event, this is what she called, what he calls an ereignis, an event, an unfolding, a horizon. Um, in which I experience being's call and my own turn to being. And thus I experience my transcendence or my standing in being. And it's in this kind of thoughtful standing in this clearing, as Heidegger calls it, of my connection between Dasein, standing in, being there, and being, that I hold myself in this Gelassenheit and don't impose my will on beings. Um, now, Arendt's critique of this, right, is that in this kind of thinking, there's an acquiescence to necessity, right? Um, that Nietzsche's yes to life and Heidegger's Gelassenheit or letting be give in to the world and don't take a position of acting to change it. And Aaron wants to criticize this submission um, of willing to thinking, um, which by the way, she sees in almost every thinker we've read, except for Duns Scotus. Um, but, but that's where, where she's coming from, from here. Um, uh, we might want to, um, you know, compare our, uh, Nietzsche's amor fati, right? The, the love of fate, the embrace of the eternal return of the same. Um, Heidegger's letting be and Arendt's 
Amor Mundi or love of the world. Um, for Arendt, the love of the world is not a letting the world be. It's loving it, seeking to understand it, reconciling oneself to its irreconcilability, and then also trying to change it. Right? That's 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 the love of the world includes changing the world for Arendt. Heidegger, at least in this reading of Heidegger, um, is so gun shy, terrified of seeking to change the world, right? Which he tried to do in 1931 to 33 and became a tool of the Nazis, that in Arendt's reading, he recoils from all political action and all action except for thinking. And that's um and 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 that total pacifism, um well, it's not pacifism, uh, political pacifism, um, which he comes to embrace as a response in Arendt's reading um, to his mistaken political action or unsuccessful political action in the early 1930s. Um, uh, it, for her, uh, leads to this rejection of willing um, that she thinks um, uh, um, doesn't do justice to the world because we have to engage in it. All right. Um, Heidegger is very complicated. Uh, I've spent most of my life reading Heidegger and trying to understand it at this point. Um, you know, uh, I don't expect us to all agree, get it, et cetera. I'm happy to do what I can in the next hour to, to, to make it as clear as we can. Um, but, um, you know, let's always just come back to... Um, the place of these texts in the book, right? Which is willing is about freedom. Um, Heidegger in the end comes to see freedom as a freedom to uh, um, align oneself and think oneself in uh, an historical epic of being and um, to some degree to let it be. Um, uh, and also to open up new possibilities potentially in the way that we can be. Uh, that's not how Arendt sees freedom, right? Arendt sees freedom as um, the freedom to act uh, together with others to change the world. Uh, it's a political freedom. And that's where they are going to disagree. And, and Arendt's attempt to... Um, valorize and save the will against the whole history of philosophy from Augustine through Heidegger is an attempt to hold on to that vision of politics as um, as 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 meaningful. Um, and so that's the that's what we have to hold on to as amidst all the difficulties of what Heidegger is saying. All right. Um, uh, Happy to engage in a conversation. Um, there's two ways to, to do that. One is through the chat, which is always active and I see is already very active. Um, please be respectful to all of you and all, all of us, uh, especially with Heidegger, it can get sometimes um, testy. So uh, let's all be respectful. And then you can raise your hand and um, uh, use that, go down to the reactions button, click on reactions, click on raise hand, and I will call on you in order that you raise your hand. And I'll do my best. I mean, this is complicated stuff. All right, uh, John, you wanted to start from last week, I know. Yeah, thank you. On page 171, 72, we speak of, it's, uh, Arnold speaks of Nietzsche's re repudiation of the will. Why is, for me, repudiation has always been deny its ex it, it, to deny the existence of. The fact that the will exists in the does cannot affect the past, nor really the future. Why is it? Why does the fact that it does exist in the present? Why is it a repudiate? I don't understand why it's a repudiation. Um, if it's functioning 
in the present, which I believe Nietzsche says, yes, that occurs, but denies it in the two other time sequences. Yeah, I mean, okay, so I mean, there's a way in which your question is is simply maybe one based on definition of repudiation. I don't know if, if that's, but but let's just try and understand it. What Nietzsche repudiates um, is the power of the will to will what it wants. The will has to will, I mean, has to, the will for Nietzsche in order to um, maintain itself has to transform itself into the will to will what, that, that everything that happens happen again in the exact same sequence way detail. And so um, you're still willing, but you're willing in a way that's uh, a, a circumscribed willing because your will is no longer free. Your will has to be to will what already has happened and will it again. Um, and so the kind of contingency uh, that Dun Scottis celebrates, the ability to will new things, the ability to will bad things that Paul uh, doesn't like, but is there in Paul, um, uh, is now um, repudiated. And the will has to, um, in order to maintain itself as power, um, has to will uh, what, you know, the, the eternal return of the same. And so it's another way of subjugating the will to, to not thinking in this case, because not it's not thought in Nietzsche, but to um, history. In a sense, the will can't overcome its limits, and so it simply wills that it is limited in this way. And that's a repudiation of its power and its freedom. Um, okay? No, not really. No? Um, uh, what I'm hearing is uh, that the will needs to, there's got to be a consistency to the will and that it can't, and there's no freedom of a adaptation. Well, Nietzsche is saying that the will has to will the eternal return of the same in order to not be resentful uh, that it can't control the past. And so the will can't will whatever it wants it has to will it's caught it has to it has to in a sense um subordinate itself to past wills that have willed what happened and that's a repudiation of the freedom of the will thank you i i need to think on that last statement i I don't want to take up more time. Okay. Thank you. Um, Bob. Roger, that uh, your explication was terrific. I mean, I, you know, I'd always puzzled over Heidegger, but uh, now I think I understand it, although yours might be your interpretation. Um, nevertheless, th thank you very much. By the way, that's the very picture of being snowbound. Yeah, uh, I can see. It's coming our way. <laughs> but I do have a, a question here on page 191 at the bottom where he used or Are you there, Bob? Use air. Yeah. Hello? Yeah, okay. Go yeah, now I can. Go ahead. Aaron Steve, at the bottom of 191. So why, why use that term for beings, errancy? Without errancy, there would be no connection from destiny to destiny. There would be no history. So this is, um, I'm just gonna just check the footnotes, but I think that's- Yeah, from the Anaximander fragment. That's the Anaximander fragment, okay. Um, 
so if you don't mind, I'm just going to read the paragraph so I can situate myself. Um, in the course of this speculation, the reversal of Heidegger's common approach to the quest for being, die Seinsfrage, and the oblivion of being, being Seinsvergessenheit, becomes manifest. All right, that's good. It is no longer genuine inauthenticity or any other particularly particularity of human existence that causes man to forget being. All right. So our forgetfulness of being, right? And and Zeins Vergessenheit or the forgetfulness of being is that we forget, we get so wrapped up in the world of beings, the snow, the trees, the pens, the books, the people, that all we care about is using them and seeing them and we get caught up in, in that realm and we don't ask the question of what, what's it all for? Why? What? We don't ask the question of the being of beings um, and which is not itself a being. And, you know, Heidegger's earliest thought from being in time onward is, is, is obsessed with the fact that most of us get caught up, so caught up in the world of things that we never stop to ask, well, who am I? Or, or what is a dog? Or what is a pen? Or things like that. And so um, uh, what she's saying here is, um, it's no longer genuine inauthenticity or other particularity of human existence that causes man to forget. It's not like that, but it's actually part of um, um, being itself withdraws. Now, whenever you say things like being withdraws, you know, you're, 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 it sounds like God, and that's not what Heidegger means but it's very hard. It takes a long time of reading Heidegger to figure it out because being is not sein ist nicht. There is no such, there is no being of beings. Remember being is not a being. And so there is not something that withdraws, but there is this thing there. No, there is, but no, I can't say is, but, but being withdraws sein, um, uh, and backed. And, um, what she's saying is that this oblivion of being belongs to the self veiling of being. Um, uh, what this means then for is through beings withdrawal from the realm of beings, these entities, namely the beings, um, are set adrift in errancy. Now, what, what does errancy means here? It means that because being has withdrawn and these beings are not, and the beings are not aware of the being that has withdrawn, not the being, of, of being withdrawn. They go any which way because they don't have, uh, they don't have a purpose. They don't have a sense of why they're there. And they're errant in that sense of missing the mark. They don't, they're not called back to being, which is to stand in the, and think being. Um, and this errancy constitutes the realm of error, the space in which history unfolds. Without errancy, there would be no connection from destiny to destiny. There would be no history. The whole unfolding of human history and of world history is the history of beings who go on and do different things disconnected from being. And um, Heidegger's thought um, well, okay, we, we've talked about two parts of his thought today, and let me just say them. One is that in that errancy, in that disconnection from being, we become obsessed with other beings. And what is the main way we become obsessed with other beings, Bob? We want to do what? We want to dominate them and master them. And, and so we begin to see all beings as simply um, uh, things to be mastered, including other human beings and other and the world and the earth. And, and that errancy um, for Heidegger, uh, which is, um, which is a, which is a, which is part and parcel of a world in which being has withdrawn 
and left man simply master of other beings um, uh, is leading to disaster, right? That's Heidegger's reading. Um, and the, the response to that is to think to the extent we can are to think being, to, to think, to stand and think in such a way that we return ourselves to the fact that all beings have a being. That, that's, not a, that's not a being. That all beings have a dignity, that all beings have a worth, that all beings have something about them which we must respect and we must let them be, gelassenheit. We must let all beings be. And, and so Heidegger's radical rejection of willing to gelassenheit, to not willing, the will not to will, um, is uh, an attempt to let beings be. Um, but it's one that also can lead to passivity. And, and that's Arendt's critique of it. Is that, I mean, so errancy is simply the, 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 the way beings go from, you know, thing to thing, trying to dominate each other without thinking about being. They're errant, They're, they lose their being. Thank you. You're welcome. Bill. Yes, uh, hello, Roger. Um, uh, too many, too many things are going on, but I'll try to maybe, maybe uh, I'll just say two things. One, I would like uh, if you could just pick up the question. Uh, it's not even a question. It's how art makes its way uh, into um, this discourse. And I sometimes uh, you can hear me, Roger, right? I hear you. Yeah, I'm just looking for the yeah, chapter yeah. on art, the section on art. Uh, I, I actually, I'm, I, I think it's on page. Um, uh, uh, it's, it's 80, bottom of 85. Uh, she uses some examples of what she does with great poets and all. I'm not right. sure if this is about the thinking, that, that idea. Uh, that to me, I'd like you to just, if it was relevant to our discussion here, because as you know, that's what I'm putting all of my um, being into as a man who is now um, looking at the end of career. My moving body, my body is changing. I cannot move like I did before. I am still making, and I don't, sometimes I don't know why the hell I'm making what I make. And I think it may be, I was trying to take heart in what she was saying here. Uh, and it also goes back to what I'm understanding the whole purpose of the book is. Um, I thought that in Eichmann in Jerusalem, the, the, as I, in very layman's term, understood the message of the banality of evil was that Eichmann literally was not able to think. And I said, ah, now I understand why she has a book called The Life of the Mind, groundbreaking investigation of how we think. This is supposed to be falling off on that critique of this small man who did great evil and yeah. saying, I'm going to look at what we mean. What did she mean by his inability to think? So I'm going to let go. But first, if, if there's something relevant about the artist um, and spontaneity, the artist and creation, and what the purpose of this book, if I can use that term, ultimately was for her. Was it really a guide on how to think? Because now we're at the end of it, and we end on this very peculiar note with Heidegger. Um, and I thought this book was going to be a percussive, not rebuttal of the banality of evil, but it's, uh, well, whatever, I've said two things. I'm not sure if they're connected, but uh, it's, it's an interesting discussion. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Um, let, me, let me take the second part first, if I can. I mean, so um, first of all, let's also just remind ourselves that this book is not a book. It didn't get, it's not finished. It was supposed mm. to be in three volumes. Um, she died with the title page of volume three in her typewriter. So um, this was not supposed to be the end of the book. And I think that's an important um, uh, recollection. 
um, uh, to the extent that um, she does say, right, in the in the whatever it's called, the preface or introduction to the book, that um, you know one of the two reasons she's writing the book is to think through um, the problem of Eichmann. Um, uh, you know, first of all, we should say that the 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 primary thought of the problem of Eichmann is in at least in what we have is in volume one in, in the volume on thinking. Um, uh, in which she argues that thinking um, is not about truth, but is about meaning. And that when she, so if we want to understand what she means when she says Eichmann didn't think, um, we have to um, think of it in that way uh, and understand it in that way. Um, I do think, I'm sorry, I'm using the word think a lot here, but I do think that volume three, which was to be on judging, um, was also going to be, I mean, I think, really the problem with Eichmann is not only that he didn't think, but he didn't, he didn't know how to judge. Um, and, um, and, and, and so um, part three is where I think we would have come back to that. And I think the book would have worked through that. Um, you know, we're going to read in the next five months, four or five months, um, we're going to read most of what Arendt wrote on judging that she, you know, that, may or may not have had, it may or may not have been what she was gonna write in volume three. I mean, who, who knows? Um, uh, but we're gonna read some of that and we'll, we'll try and keep that in mind. Um, but I think what you're bringing up and I think is an important part of it is that willing is sort of the odd man out in this book, right? So thinking and judging um, for Arendt uh, are really, um, go together in, in many ways. Uh, thinking is about uh, meaning. Uh, thinking is um, about a withdrawal from the world in a way. Uh, and, 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 and it's about the pursuit of meaning, not truth. Judging is an attempt to judge particulars according to um, uh, some standard. Um, uh, and, 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 and willing is, you know, is the weird the weird guy out is the willing is is the you know it's the it's what all the philosophers want to get rid of because it's the problem of evil it's the problem of freedom it's the problem of evil um and and so you know you might think oh Arendt's gonna you know do what all the other philosophers do which is say oh willing is bad um but her what what's 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 what makes Arendt really unique in this weird history of philosophy, which she sort of belongs to and sort of doesn't belong to, um, is that she sees in willing, um, and thus, well, the problem of freedom and evil. And even though she's obsessed with the problem of freedom and evil and the dangers that they cause, she is not going to subordinate, she doesn't want to subordinate freedom uh, to uh, thinking. She wants to argue for um, the dignity of freedom as a human idea and human action. Um, and so um, she, she's this whole book on willing, except the chapter on Duns Scotus really, is sort of a, um, a, a, a telling of a story of the of the of the exclusion of willing from philosophy that she wants to correct, um, uh, and that she finds problematic because it's an exclusion of freedom, done in the name of preventing evil, but she thinks actually might lead more to more evil because it leads to a stopping of freedom and a stopping of thinking um, than anything else. So that's the answer about the whole book. I mean, we haven't read the whole book. Um, we're going to try and read um the, the the parts on judging that we have the, the segments on judging that we have and and we'll uh we'll do what we can with it um but um but i think yeah well, i'll see if i can say more later but um on the artistic question um so she starts this i think around page 183 actually a little earlier 
where she's talking about Big Son. Um, um, and she says that uh, in about two thirds of the way down the page and Brigson quite in line with Nietzsche and also as it were in tune with Heidegger sees the proof of this spontaneity. I think that's the spontaneity of the will if I'm not mistaken um, in the fact of artistic creativity. The coming into existence of a work of art cannot be explained by antecedent causes as though what is now actual has been latent or potential before whether in the form of external causes or inner motives. When a musician composes a symphony, was his work possible before being real? Heidegger is quite in line with the general position when he writes in volume one of Nietzsche, to will always means to bring oneself to oneself, willing we encounter ourselves as who we are authentically. So um, artistic creativity here is just another word for freedom and willing. Uh, in, in this sense, where that we don't say that an artist created a work because what have you ate for breakfast or things like that, or, or because of who his parents were, or because of, you know, who, who knows what, whether he's rich or poor or, or whatever it is. Um, uh, what then goes on in, in, in the next few pages is um, a discussion of schuld or guilt and conscience, um, uh, where um, the main point, she says on 184 of Heidegger's idea of guilt is that human existence is guilty to the extent that it factually exists. It does not need to become guilty through something, through omissions or commissions to actualize authentic, authentically the guiltiness, which it is anyhow. Um, there's a kind of uh, a guilt that we all have. Arendt finds this wrong, she says it, um, uh, but there's a kind of need to um, uh, respond, um, uh, to answer in, in some way. And, and, and then, and this is where you, your, your, what you asked came in, um, the way we answer is to hear the summons of being and to think and also to thank. And so she then cites um, these three poets, Mandelstam, Rilke, and Auden, um, as three poets who reflect what she calls the dilemmas of the last stage of the modern age, right? This is on 186 after the Auden poem. Um, what are the dilemmas of the last stage of the modern age? Um, well, they are the dilemmas that after 2000 years of rational thought from Plato on and after two to 300 years of science. Um, and after 150 years or so of the belief in progress, we're still stuck, not getting any better. We're still stuck. And what are our options, right? We can continue to believe in progress and science and reason Look how good that's doing for us. We can rebel against science and turn back to rage and anger and tribalism and um, all sorts of basic identities, right? That has its problems too. Or we can take Arendt's approach, uh, which is what she's saying of the poet's approach here which is to love the world in its multiplicity and its complexity and struggle with it and try and live without banisters. Um, you know, so the artist, insofar as the artist imagines themselves as free and imagines themselves as trying to love the world in its dirtiness and 
complexity and com and 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 messiness um is is in one sense doing what heidegger calls thinking which is to um think the being of beings and not just beings to step back from the world of beings and think and then to thank for that um um Arendt's intervention is to say that's not enough um not that art is not enough but Heidegger's but simply standing there thinking is not enough you need to also act and 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 look there's an argument I think a good argument by the way so an argument that Heidegger also is an artist right he writes things and he engages in the world he puts works into the world they may not be works of painting or of movement but they're works of writing and thought and his let's be very honest his works of art have had enormous impact on thinkers and artists for for now almost 100 years I mean, since he was writing in the 1920s yeah 1920s so um i think you can say you know i can i think if you want to if you want to redeem heidegger from arendt's critique to some degree you read heidegger as an artist who actually is acting in the world and not just thinking um and uh and i think that's a fair reading of heidegger that arendt doesn't take seriously in this in this way because she's trying to she's trying to focus on the difference between heidegger's idea of acting or thinking and thinking and acting and hers and um and and heidegger's ref, ref, not repudiation of the will but his will not to will, um, which which she finds problematic to say the least. Um, um, so, um, yeah, does that help at all? Oh, uh, that's um, that's that's very uh, important. It's very important to hear. Uh, thank you very much, Roddy. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Thank I you. appreciate it. Uh, who's next? Uh, Dina. Hi there. Uh... I have a question that actually I think follows up on what you just said. Um, and the text I'm referring to is the last paragraph of this section on page 194. Okay, one sec. 94, yeah, very much the end. Um, and um, so the middle of that last paragraph, um, Arendt, uh, well, she concedes in the paragraph that um, her interpretation is very tentative. Uh, um, here as to um, Heidegger's views and especially because of the Anaximandra essay. And then in the middle of the paragraph, she says that um, um, Heidegger's denunciation of the instinct of self-preservation uh, common to all living things as a willful rebellion against the order of creation as such is so rare in the history of ideas that she then proceeds to quote uh, from a poem by Goethe and if we think back um, to the human condition, we sort of know why she says it, why that is such a rare, um, such a rare moment in, his, in the history of ideas. But it, it did make me think about um, pushing back just a little bit um, in terms of her just distinguishing herself from Heidegger and whether or not here at least, there isn't, it doesn't write, it doesn't, raise the question whether, to speak in Kantian terms, the condition of possibility for the political is the moment of renunciation of um, the instinct of self-preservation. Um, I mean, that seem, seems to be intimated in the human condition, right? That the Absolutely. So, so she ends this chapter, right? Uh, she ends the chapter on a discussion about Heidegger with this type of renunciation, right? That at least to some extent, the renunciation that he speaks of uh, when we are free from irrelevant influences in our day to day, right? In Heidegger, it's the moment that we are uh, conceiving of freedom um, as, as sort of 
seeing oneself in a historical epic of being. But for Arendt, this seems to be the condition of possibility for, polit for the political in the first place. I think that's right. Uh, that's a great question. I mean, so, you know, for Arendt, absolutely, you're right. Uh, courage is the first virtue of politics because at, in politics, um, what is it, the world and not the self is at stake? Is that the right quote? Um, uh, okay, I may have it a little off, but that's basically it. Um, uh, Arendt deeply believes that politics requires us to care about the human world, not ourselves, uh, not, and, and thus, um, if you have too strong an instinct for self-preservation, you can't engage in politics. Um, this, uh, so, you know, it's an interesting parallel you're drawing, she's drawing here and that you're pointing to, um, which is that, Arendt elevates the world over the self, over the individual, um, in that sense. And Heidegger elevates being, sein, uh, over the individual, in the sense that the individual must be a, a, um, a shepherd of being. He must preserve being. So, uh, this is, you know, there, there's all sorts of ways to read Heidegger and Arendt uh, in conversation with each other, and it's something I do a lot, and I think it's important. But here, the, 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 the question becomes, what's the difference between being for Heidegger and world for Arendt? Um, uh, and uh, I think for what, what, what Arendt learns from, look, Arendt learned a ton from Heidegger, and obviously he was deeply, deeply influential in her work. Um, but so what she learns from him to some degree here is that you can't simply concern yourself with, with beings. You have to also look at being, but she doesn't want to look at being as some sort of quasi, you know, I mean, what do you want to call it? Mystical thing in Heidegger's work. So what does she look at? She looks at the human world. Well, what is the world? Is, isn't the world also this sort of quasi-mystical thing in Arendt's work? Well, um, the world is for her um, the, the collective stories and institutions and histories that we build that make human life meaningful. Um, and, uh, and, and, and I think that's, and, 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 and that is for the sake of which politics is, is the world. Um, yeah, I'm not sure I have much more to say. I think it's a good point. And it's a good question. The there's, eternal there's world, the, go ahead. This other theme in, in the human condition that is definitely not as, as made, made as expressed by Arendt. But, you know, she talks a lot vis-a-vis -vis Marx about um, abund the abundance of life, right? That this extra that makes us um, um, who we are. And in the Nietzsche chapter, she brings up this superabundance of life and abundance of life again. And I think, I think part of this is also wrestling with, um, you know, this sort of, this, this remainder, and I don't know if she would call it being or not, you know, and that's really not that important, but I think this idea of abundance and superabundance that comes up in the human condition as well is part and parcel of trying to understand the relationship between her concept of the world and being. Um. Yeah. Um, yeah, the superabundance of life. In all, in, in the human condition, right, is, 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 is um, 
is that part of what saves us from just falling into right. the eternal uh, recurrent, the eternal, you know, as, as good to hear says the eternal works and stirs and all, right. you know, and, and, and allows us to not be lost in sort of some eternal swing of history is, you know, our desire to make money or eat or succeed or the, the, the needs of life. And she says, these are not to be underestimated. They're part of what it means to be human because they make us individuals. They make us different. Um, uh, and, and give us a kind of joy in, in working and then resting and working and resting. Um, you know, I don't think that's the same as the kind of joy that Nietzsche gets in the will to power. I'm not saying you're saying it was. No, no, no. Yeah, I'm not saying that. Um, uh, but yeah, um, there's why, no doubt. Why, that... it's, just, it's just explains why we even bother to step out of the hearth uh, that is limiting us to sort, sort of, to just the ever recurring, procreating cycle of life. Right. So, right. And one is to live, right? So if you look at, if you look at the three parts of the human condition in the middle, one reason we step out of it is, is life joy um and to stay alive but also to have joy another is to produce works to produce artworks that we can that will um outlast us and thus make us immortal and the third is to act and build things with others um so those are three ways we um step out of a kind of being lost in the eternal and and become human in that way okay thank you that's good. that's good though thank you greg yeah hi the more um the, the more we talk here every we have this conversation the harder it is to get my head around the question i'm trying to ask but you know Arendt goes on in, in many of her writings about sort of western philosophy has always had this metaphysical fallacy about some kind of reality behind the backs or above the heads of people. And whether it's Plato, you know, or whomever else. And it's because of this, and this is sort of my understanding of her work, so please correct me if I'm wrong, but because of this, philosophy has never been able to articulate action. And if all of this book is prompted by Eichmann, who failed to think, he also failed to act, right? And he participated in the world, but only in its social reproduction as an empty suit. He never affected the world in any kind of distinct way. Well, do you really right? think so, Greg? I mean, he, he certainly acted, and he certainly affected the world in profound ways through his actions. His actions were thoughtless. But I don't think they were act. They, I don't think they were without action. Yeah, you know, I guess that's part of the question I'm trying to unpack. And I was going to tie this back to willing. Is, is, is that you know, Arndt, I can't tell if Art wants to break away from Nietzsche and Heidegger on willing because they seem to have this kind of either eternal recurrence or passivity, which sort of denies someone their own sort of initiative. I don't know if that's a correct reading, if that's what she's doing with them, but I'm trying to figure that out. But anyway, but, but on, I, I'm sorry, on Eichmann, I mean, I guess the way I've always seen it is that he participated passively in an ideological machine. And because he was so passive, that machine was so destructive that he reproduced empty rhetoric. He reproduced all these bureaucratic cliches she's talked about. So he participated as an agent, but he never inserted himself as a, a distinct actor, a plurality one of the plurality of the world. He sort of sacrificed his own distinctiveness to, to, to be sucked into this machine of destruction. And I don't, I'm not sure that Arendt wants to call that action, or I guess that's also part of my question, is if we participate thoughtlessly in the world, are we willingly in the world or are we just sort of an agent in the world, one tool in its reproduction? sort of the laboring process of reproduction for reproduction's sake. So I guess I'm not being totally clear on this question, but it, right. it, it, it seems like with Heidegger and Nietzsche, I'm just wondering, is she trying to break away from them because they retain this kind of transcendental element that operates behind people's backs? 
And if so, then Eichmann himself is just being pushed along thoughtlessly. And how can we call this guy an actor? He's an agent. He's a tool, a very okay, destructive so one. I know, I'll I leave it at that now. Yeah. A couple things to, to say, right? One is she, she does distinguish Heidegger from Hegel and others who talk about the, the ruse of reason for Kant or the invisible hand for Adam Smith or, um, you know, the, 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 the history of, you know, of the rationality of history for, for, for Hegel. Um, you know, for all of these folks, there's a way in which the world unfolds in a kind of rational way. Um, that's not true for Heidegger, right? And so on, on page 180, um, she says, uh, while it may look this way, uh, certainly Heidegger's Seinsgeschichte that cannot fail to remind us of Hegel's world spirit. The difference, however, is decisive, right? When Hegel saw the world spirit on horseback in Napoleon at Jena, he knew that Napoleon himself was unconscious of being the incarnation of the spirit. In a sense, Napoleon acted thoughtlessly and brought the world spirit to its next stage, but not um, uh, having thought about world spirit, just doing what he wanted to do. Um, for Heidegger, it's different. For Heidegger, um, uh, it is being itself that forever changing, right? Being itself forever changing manifests itself in the thinking of the actor so that acting and thinking coincide. That's the that's the that's where Heidegger is different. Heidegger still acts, still holds action. He just think action is thinking, right? Now, this is what I in my answer to Bill, I I amended this to some degree and said, well, it's not just thinking; it's also work, art, and making art or, ma or writing, and and thus impacting the world. But Arendt only reads it as thinking and acting. Um, um, so, so this brings you to, this brings us to your question about someone like Eichmann, who is clearly not thinking in Arendt's account, but, um, certainly seems to act. Uh, now is he therefore like Napoleon, uh, you know, the embodiment of a Hegelian world spirit. Um, uh, maybe, I don't know, but I don't think that's Arendt's reading of him. I, I think he's uh, a lonely uh, uh, man who, um, who, who, who acts, uh, intentionally not thinking because he, if he did he would not act in order to uh uh further his career and his ambitions uh um at the behest of uh a bureaucratic system that uh, uh is intent on on doing incredible uh evil um uh yeah i mean i i, I think she sees the system of the Nazi Reich and the Bolshevik uh, bureaucracy as a system of bureaucratic action. And as a result, it's action, but it's action that um, uh, reflects a certain incarnation of, uh, of, of the world if you're a Hegelian, not if you're a Rentian, but if you're a alien, it's it's the world of the human will uh, transferred into bureaucratic directives designed to um, uh, use the resources of the of the country uh, to achieve certain ends, be it communism or Nazism, um, uh, and um, and and in that sense. It's the, it's the most dangerous kind of action because it's the action in which there's no actor. And in an action in which there's no actor, it's hard to resist it because you don't know who to, who to, who to, who to fight against. Um, I mean, that's, that's her analysis of 
the dangers of bureaucracy. Um, and, and that certainly there's action in bureaucracy. It's just, it's a kind of impersonal action. Um, so, yeah, I mean, you know, we can, we can sit there and say, well, it's not action in the way she wants people to act. Okay. But it's still, I mean, I, I, I don't know what it would mean to say that Eichmann didn't act. I mean, clearly he did, and he did a lot of terrible things and uh, the world is the worst for it. Yeah, I just um, think she has a more specific understanding of what action is. And yeah, I mean, I know one way to get at that is to say, well, what isn't action? If I go to the grocery store and get my groceries, I'm impacting the world, right? But is that action? Well, I mean, you know, uh, um, uh, I think there's there's obviously there's there's different there's different levels of action that can um, start things. You know, action is for her uh, to insert oneself in, into the world, to act freely, and to start something new. Every action, you know, can, but very few do. Um, you know, when you go to the grocery store, you're probably not starting something new. You know, on a general on a, on a, on a, on a big, ba on a big level. Um, but, uh, uh, I think you can safely say that Eichmann's actions, actions started something new. Um, you know, I mean, uh, I mean, if it weren't for Eichmann's actions, the whole world would be different today. I, I, I don't know how to, I, I can't imagine thinking of him as someone who, who, who doesn't act. I mean, I think you have to say he acted thoughtlessly, he acted bureaucratically. Um, but I don't think you can say he didn't act, but you know, I don't know. I mean, I'm not, part of it is I'm not sure what's at stake in that question. I mean, at one point, then we get caught up in action as what's your definition of action and this and that. And that's not something that I guess I get really too worked up on. Um, um, so I don't know, is there something at stake in, in that? Well, I, I think there's quite a bit, but um, but anyway, I, I think that's enough of my question. I see Ken's got his hand up, and maybe we should just move on then. Okay, Ken, we get the last question. Oh, thanks. Um, I hope it's related. Um, what I was curious about is we could unpack uh, Heidegger's idea of the they and also care, because it seems like that's where they come together a little closer. Um, his but his, the way he uses the word they, I, I keep hearing uh, Hannah Arendt using the masses, only he seems to think it's inescapable that um, I'm thinking of in totalitarianism, not everyone becomes a mob or the masses. It's when they sort of quit thinking for themselves. It's maybe when they become more like Eichmann and Eichmann stops judging and then he participates as a bureaucratic machine or he stops he's not choosing his examples well and he's just he'll just take whatever comes up so he happens to be following hitler he could have been following rockefeller if that was who was there because yeah. he gave up his he gave up his judgment and he gave up his own thinking and became extremely productive the banality was that he just would follow anybody i think i remember in uh i'm cheating a little bit because i was reading responsibility and judgment and she says that's more dangerous than someone thinking for themselves and choosing badly is actually not choosing. Um, but the, what it seems like he slips into is the masses then, as opposed to a man with impetus and decision-making and judging. And, that's what he, and he loses his humanity in that. And it seems like Heidegger giving up on the they and just saying we have to oppose it by thinking and not participating sounds to me a little like he doesn't see any options besides becoming the masses if we act and that's and that's the airing he's talking about except if maybe his out is talking about care which we didn't really discuss so that's why i was asking if we could unpack care and the they a little bit more um yeah um i'm not sure i'm gonna be able to uh you know, 
do much of that. But on page 182, she says the emphasis shifts from sorga or care as worry or concern with itself to sorga as taking care. And this not of itself, but of being, right? And this is this is the shift in Heidegger from care for Dasein to Dasein's here to care for being, to be the shepherd of being, the air here to the, the signs. Um, uh, you know, the, the uh, you know, the, the, the place of care and being in time is, is very, is not something we can, I can go into right now. Um, it's, uh, it's a part of being in time that's always been probably a, it may be the part of being time that's always been the most un I don't know uninteresting or or I don't understand it <laughs> um um so I you know take what you will um uh, so I don't have much to say about it uh off the top of my head I haven't not read it in 10 years um well, she also so, slides from there. She seems like he doesn't talk about it enough either because that's where she turns to Bergson and then to art. And we get back to Bill's question that there's something about maybe renewing the world of the masses that's possible or getting to something more uh, human or fundamental there through, through caring or something. It's, that's where it does sound a little bit religious to me. Yeah, I, I I don't have I just don't have that much to say about care. I and it's my weakness in reading Heidegger. I don't know. It's never been a part of his um, work that made a whole lot of sense to me, and it doesn't really come back in much of his later works. And so I've I haven't done much with it. Well, maybe that might be also why she's sort of dismissing Heidegger here, because it seems like she doesn't want to say that we will necessarily fall into the masses, that there has to be options for newness and something else. And maybe care is just too weak for that. Can I jump in really quick? Yep. Here? I, um, Ken, I was, I was interested in that same page on 183. And one way I read it was less about say the they and more about habit, right? Uh -huh. That she's talk. And I also started to think about this almost in a, um, sort of like a modernist art practice, right? That he's, he feels in this sort of they that we become embedded with a set of language that becomes the sort of language of the they. And that the, you know, I guess cycling back to what he's calling being via the artist and spontaneity kind of renews that. And so for me, that, that resonated with Arendt's sort of insistence that we, um, look at the embeddedness of language, look at the embeddedness of concepts and of our habits and prejudices. So I saw a kind of connection there that did not necessarily seem at odds, that it's this practice of constantly reinspecting the inherited qualities of our speech and lived world. And um, this may not be, sort of, you know, at odds with what you were saying, but I didn't think they matched up exactly between sort of the masses and and the they. I would just chime in. Thank you, Tara. Yeah, thank you. Um, is that all right, Ken? It's great. Yeah, and also, it also lends a roundness to discussion because it really brings it back to what Bill was asking earlier too about renewing language and renewing uh, otherwise tired, habitual, prejudiced world with doing something new and uh, an unexpected action. Okay, cool. Great, thank you guys. Um, so we got one more week of reading, uh, well, of the first of the volume on Willing and then we're gonna start February 11th. Um, with the, uh, I just I just did realize that my schedule just got changed today, Tara, so we're gonna have to look at the schedule again. Um, 
but we are going to meet February 11th and start uh, judgment. And um, uh, but but first next Friday, uh, we're going to read the final chapter of Willing, the Abyss of Freedom and the Novus Ordo Secularum. Uh, I look forward to reading that with you. Enjoy reading Hannah Arendt and I'll see you next week.